Welcome to At Issue. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm H. Wayne Wilson, and for the next half hour, we're very pleased to have with us in the studio newly elected Congressman Aaron Schock. Aaron, welcome to the program. Thanks, Ainge. Thanks for having me on. Uh, uh, has it sunk in yet? It has. Uh, probably, um, I've been so, so busy with the campaign and then after the election uh, with getting things ready that I think it was uh, after I was assigned my office space uh, out in, in D.C. and standing in the office, uh, I realized that um, um, that we did it, that uh, we had won, and um, that this was really happening. So it was uh, an exciting feeling, uh, but also um, daunting given all of the, the challenges facing our country and also the responsibility that the constituents in my 18th district uh, have entrusted to me. It's a responsibility I don't take lightly. And I look forward to starting in January and, and uh, working very hard for this district. You've had a chance to meet some of your incoming freshman class uh, in orientation. Uh, I assume you've met some of the senior members of Congress. Uh, do, has there been any discussion about you being young? Well, certainly uh, that's something that I can't hide when someone meets me. Uh, uh, obviously, um, I look my age. And uh, so, you know, that's something that people are aware of. now. Our freshman class actually is very diverse. There are a handful of us that are uh, in our, I should say, there are a handful in their 30s. Um, and so we have a, a, a relatively young freshman class uh, relative to the rest of Congress. Um, but you know, our, our party leadership and the leadership in Congress is looking for new ideas, a fresh perspective, um, an alternative way of looking at things. And I think that the 50 new freshmen coming into Congress Different ages, different backgrounds, different set of experiences uh, are going to kind of be the, the, the new blood, uh, if you will, the transfusion that, that our country really needs uh, to get us out of the rut that we're in. We'll talk about some of those federal issues in just a moment, but I want to give you an opportunity to reflect back on four years in the Illinois State Legislature. Do you have any parting suggestions to the state legislature on what they might do to help the state of Illinois at this point in time? Well, I really enjoyed my time in the state legislature. The most uh, rewarding part of my job really was the constituent work, the people that I helped day in and day out. As you know, my district here in central Illinois is a very needy district. It gave me the opportunity to do that. Probably the biggest frustration was uh, in Springfield. Um, the uh, stalemate that we are in there, um, really the, the dysfunction in state government right now with one party control, uh, with leadership in, in the House, the Senate, and the governor. Uh, who have spent the majority of the time fighting with one another, which really has been unproductive for uh, the taxpayers and the citizens of Illinois. So if there's anything overriding that I hope would happen would be that um, we'd get a little adult supervision in Springfield, that we'd get leaders down there that act like adults and that will sit down um, and talk in an honest and open way so we can deal, these, deal with these challenges. There's not going to be any quick fixes to the unfunded liability in the state pension system, which is the highest in the country. Um, the f nearly $5 billion in uh, backlog in, in Medicaid uh, debt at the Comptroller's office right now. Um, if we want to talk about uh, infrastructure programs, the, the governor has done a great job of talking about how we need an infrastructure program, a capital budget. We've gotten very uh, little progress in that area. But if we're going to deal with any of those issues, um, there's going to need to be trust. And right now, there's not trust between the Speaker of the House, the Senate President, and the governor. And that's fundamental in any relationship to make things happen. So, um, you know, it, it may sound simple, but we need a change in leadership in the state government in order for that to happen. Now, we have a new state uh, uh, Senate president coming in, uh, John Cullerton, and I'm hopeful that uh, he will bring um, more of a spirit of working together with uh, his counterpart in the state house, uh, Mike Madigan, and uh, hopefully together. Uh, those two can work with the governor to pass a capital budget to deal with the unfunded liability in the, in the teachers and public employee pension system and to pay down some of these backlog and debts uh, at the comptroller's office. But it's going to take time, but uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer where there's a will, there's a way, and none of these problems are insurmountable if people will uh, sit down and be honest and open with one another, and we haven't had that the past several years in Springfield. You, it, you have not received assignment yet for committees. Uh, but you're interested in agriculture, transportation, budget. Uh, what do you hope to accomplish if you're named to one or more of those? Well, I think without a doubt the committee that I could do the most good on as a freshman, that I could get on as a freshman, 
would be the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee for a number of reasons. Um, the five-year five highway transportation budget will be uh, debated, will be introduced, and will pass during my freshman term. And the members on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee have a whole lot more say in what projects get funded and what the final transportation budget looks like. Uh, as you know, my district is very large, 20 counties. The needs in these communities are great, 161 different incorporated towns in my district, some as large as Peoria and Springfield and Decatur, others very small, a couple hundred in, in population. Um, but they all have infrastructure needs, which are tied to economic development. And if there's anything uh, that we can agree on uh, in this country right now, it's that our economy ought to be the number one focus of our Congress and of, of our leaders. And I believe one of the best ways to get our economy moving again is to invest in our infrastructure, which will employ people, but also which will put the infrastructure in place for economic development. So employers will locate to our communities, can get their goods and services to and from our communities. Agriculture is the number one industry in my district. Uh, upgrading the locks and dams, making sure that the Water Resource Development Act, WERDA, which was passed, is funded so we can upgrade the locks and dams along the Illinois River and the Mississippi Corridor as well. That's going to be important to my district. Um, highways and bridges, rail, uh, all of those infrastructure and transportation needs in my district um, I look forward to being an advocate for uh, as a member of Congress, and I think I could be a greater advocate if I was on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Certainly agriculture would be uh, important since that is a large uh, employer in my district. The Budget Committee, um, just as the state of Illinois is, has its challenges, the federal government is no different. And the great unfunded liability at the, at the federal level with our entitlement programs, uh, with the war and all of the other spending priorities we've had, getting on that committee and learning about uh, more in depth what the problems are and um, you know, being able to recommend some solutions for the long term, uh, I think would be a good thing for my, for my district. You're talking a lot about infrastructure improvements, quite often those things occur through earmarks. What's your position on earmarks? Well, it's interesting you say that because, um, you know, one man's earmark is another man's community project, is another man's uh, needed economic development tool, uh, be it a bridge, a highway, um, uh, you name it. I, I'm a firm believer that uh, elected officials in general know better what the needs of their districts are than some unelected bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. According to our U.S. Constitution, the Constitution gives the power of the purse both to raise and to spend to the United States Congress. So for those to suggest that somehow United States Congressmen and women should abdicate their responsibility given to them by the United States Constitution to spend the money to some unelected bureaucracy, people that you cannot elect or, or re-elect, uh, that you cannot hold accountable as taxpayers and voters, um, I really think it flies in the face of what our country stands for. Having said that, without a doubt, of 435 members in the House and 100 in the Senate, there are some that have used that power uh, uh, for their benefit, um, they have become corrupt with that power, and they need to be held responsible for it. Uh, but that doesn't mean 535 members in the House and Senate um, should give up the, the responsibility um, and that privilege to know what's best for their district. Um, I'm going to be an advocate for the communities in my district, fighting to get our fair share of federal resources that we pay into these different uh, pots of money to make sure that our infrastructure needs are met, our education funding uh, we get adequate funding for, and so on. And I'm not going to be ashamed to ask for that funding. I believe in full disclosure, and I will not ask for an earmark or for funding for a project that I can't uh, sit here on your show someday and defend and explain. And I look forward to, in two years, standing before the voters uh, for re-election and being able to explain any earmark, any funding that I received for my district. Did you just announce for you're running for re-election? Is that what I Well, heard? I'll tell you what, I get sworn in in January and in September, I get to, to uh, file petitions for re-election. <laughs> so uh, there's a very short life cycle on Congress, and uh, I fully intend to run for re-election. Uh, having talked about this and, and bringing money back, your fair share of federal dollars, the federal government faces a huge deficit this year. The uh, national debt is approaching $11 trillion. How might we get, a, get control of that? You have to set priorities and you have to live within your means. It's no different than, than private individuals like you and I, H. Uh, we, have a limit, we have a limit of resources 
and we have to live within those means. And unfortunately, uh, past administrations, past Congresses have presided over uh, some of the largest spending increases in recent history. And, um, you know, two thirds of our spending every year goes to entitlement programs. And so, you know, one of the things we need to look at is the sustainability of these programs. You're not going to find a member of Congress that doesn't believe we need, doesn't believe in the solvency of things like Social Security, Medicare, making sure that they're around for future generations. But it's very scary when you look at the unfunded liability, for example, just in Medicare, which is the largest unfunded liability facing this country, and you look at the large number of baby boomers that are set to retire in the next decade, moving into Medicare that will qualify for that program, and what that's going to do to exacerbate uh, the deficit here in this country. So these are problems too often uh, our leaders have kind of pushed them off, and we don't deal with things until there's a crisis. Um, for example, in energy, uh, one of the reasons that we're dealing with the crisis now is, in my opinion, because decisions weren't made proactively 20 and 30 years ago. And if we don't get a handle on our budget now, um, things like Social Security, Medicare, and others uh, will be in jeopardy uh, because they're not going to be solvent programs. And so, you know, coming into the Congress at 27 years old, I think I have a different perspective, not because I hadn't served there, but because I'm not concerned about these programs for the next decade. I'm concerned about them for the next generation. I hope that they're there in 50 and 60 years when I'm ready to retire uh, and I've paid into Social Security and I've paid into Medicare and so on and making sure that they're solvent uh, for generations to come. You made reference to energy. So let's talk about what you would do to solve the energy crisis. And I want you to, to specifically address coal because Illinois sits on so many reserves of coal. Well, I think, first of all, uh, we haven't done anything in 30 years. We haven't built new refineries. We haven't uh, d done new drilling. We haven't done much in terms of uh, alternative energy. So I think we need a very ambitious short-term and long-term plan. Short-term, I believe we need to begin offshore drilling immediately. Uh, this oil will come on the pipeline in less than 10 years, um, which will be a real increase uh, in supply in the market. But there will also be an immediate psychological impact. One of the reasons we've seen these great increases and decreases in the price of, the f of, of fuel at the pump is because of oil speculators that are in the mar market right now. And they buy and sell commodities and crude oil based on uh, the psychology of what's going to happen with supply and demand. And just authorizing drilling, I think, will do a lot to the psychology knowing that that increase in the supply will go on the world market in years to come. Uh, we also need more nuclear power which I believe our country is very lacking in, in terms of uh, the prevalence of nuclear power in our country. You look at countries like France, which 80% of their en energy comes from nuclear power. We have the ability in our country to become completely electricity independent. Unlike crude oil, which even if we authorize drilling uh, here in our country, in Alaska and offshore, it will lessen our demand for foreign oil, but it will not completely eliminate it. However, with nuclear power, with building enough nuclear plants here in our country, we can become completely electricity independent, which I think is a very important goal when we move on to things like automobiles, which I believe in the long term, our solution there is uh, a prevalence of electric automobiles. But if we can produce that energy here domestically, uh, that will do a lot towards our, uh, our trade deficit, strengthening the dollar, and so on. So short term, uh, nuclear power, uh, coal-fired plants, um, and offshore drilling, which I believe in the next 10, 20 years, our country is going to continue to depend on natural gas and, and uh, crude oil and so on. Long term, however, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, I hope to, to, to see that uh, we've transitioned to a renewable, sustainable energy source. That's not going to happen overnight. And I don't believe the only way we're going to get there is through government uh, investment. Some have suggested, well, we need to just offer more grants. I believe we have to unleash the private marketplace. Uh, the creative genius of the American minds, I think, is better than any government program. And I would like to see a Manhattan Project style of energy innovation here in our country. I believe the best way to get there is to eliminate the taxes on the production of renewable energies. It may be a 10-year, it may be a 20-year, 0% uh, tax rate for the production of renewable energies. I can't think of a greater way to get entrepreneurs all over this country to invest their capital and to put their minds towards developing the latest and greatest electric cars, uh, better wind, better 
a solar technology so that 20 and 30, 40 years from now, we can have a reliance on that energy, but we're not there yet. And unfortunately, these decisions were not made 20 and 30 years ago, but it's gonna take time. And we, I don't believe we can have one or the other. There are some who suggest it's only oil or it's only green. Uh, we need both, we need more of everything to get us to where we need to go. Let's talk a little bit more about coal because the Department of Energy withdrew from participating on the sequestration or future gen, as we call it, down near Mattoon. Do you believe that sequestration, which is the uh, technique that they're using where they would, uh, for the audience's benefit, that would be where they would put CO2 down 7,500 feet into the earth and seal it down there. Do you believe that the Department of Energy should be reinvolved, that sequestration uh, is a good um, future for the use of coal? Well, I, be I believe we need to explore all uses of coal because uh, our country has some of the largest deposits in the world for coal. Not only our country, but also our state of Illinois has one of the largest deposits. So any way we can use more coal will be of greater benefit towards moving towards energy independence. I support the Future Gen uh, project. Uh, I don't believe that the uh, uh, Energy Department has given a very good explanation on why they pulled the plug on Future Gen and Mattoon. Uh, they seem to be 100% supportive of it when it was being debated between a location in Illinois and a location in Texas. And it wasn't until the location in Illinois was se uh, selected that they decided it wasn't a worthy project. So uh, I know that President-elect Obama has spoken in support of Future Gen. Uh, Senator Durbin here from our state, who has a very good relationship with the president, um, has spoken in support of Future Gen. So I'm hopeful that uh, the ne next administration, the president from our home state here in Illinois, will ensure that FutureGen gets back on track. But President-elect Obama has also said that he would prefer a cap and trade program that, in his words, would mean that anyone who would build a coal-fired plant would go bankrupt. Uh, do you see a change in that stance? I have, and with all due respect, I've seen a change in a number of his positions. So, um, you know, he that was a, a, a a comment he made early on in the campaign and certainly in the final weeks of the campaign when that uh, comment became an issue, he clarified it and said he did support uh, the coal industry in our country. And um, uh, until he changes his mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold him to that. A lot of manufacturing in your district. That means there's a lot of union representatives in your district. And there is legislation that would propose what's called a card check legislation whereby instead of having a private vote as to whether to unionize or not, it would be just based upon number of people who signed the cards. And then after four months, if an agreement hadn't been reached, there would be binding arbitration. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about card check legislation? Well, H, um, I don't support card check legislation. Um, first of all, let me say um, I believe in workers' rights to unionize, uh, to organize for their benefit. Um, I believe in, in that right for American workers. I'm proud to say that uh, in my race for state representative, uh, I had uh, 10 unions endorse me for re-election. In my race for Congress, I had another 10 unions endorse me uh, in this competitive election. So I've had a great relationship with organized labor and unions in my district. However, I don't believe their election uh, to unionize ought to be any different than my election to represent them in the United States Congress. It ought to be in a secret ballot. It ought to be in the privacy behind a curtain. Um, and you should not be able to um, bully or, or in any way uh, put pressure, undue pressure on someone uh, to vote a particular way. I don't believe that I should be able to walk up to you, H, and say, are you gonna vote for me for Congress and put a card in front of you and watch you sign the card uh, and, and if you don't sign it, be able to uh, bully you to sign it. Um, I don't believe that's, that's uh, how the American electoral process ought to work for elected officials or in unionization. Um, I do support the right to unionize. I think that um, just as employers should not be able to bully their employees not to unionize, unions should not be able to bully the employees to have to unionize as well. So I support the uh, private ballot form of unionization and I, and I oppose uh, this new version of a um, uh, more of a confrontational approach in my opinion. Let's talk a little bit about what Congress can do to energize the economy. A lot of bailout money being tossed around, a lot of discussion about what industries, what companies should get it, which ones shouldn't. As a freshman representative on the Hill, 
what would you suggest that the government do? How best to spend the money or not spend it? Well, I'm very uh, cautious about the federal government or any government getting involved in the private industry. Uh, I believe in the free market. I believe in, in many cases, letting the free market ride itself out in, in ups and downs. Um, that being said, I think the government uh, can play an important role in helping to stabilize markets as they have with the financial markets, uh, as they have in local markets here in our local economy. As you're familiar with the Keystone Steel and Wire deal that the state of Illinois struck to save several hundred uh, steel worker jobs here in, in Peoria. However, that deal was structured in a way where it wasn't just throwing good money after bad. It allowed the company to restructure their debt, uh, to modernize their facilities, and now that money has been paid back, the taxpayers have benefited, and those jobs have been saved. So I think it's important at the federal level that it's structured in a way where if the taxpayers are going to be on the line that there's some benefit. I'm mindful uh, of uh, the federal government's involvement in the bailout of the Mexican economy nearly 15 years ago at the end of the first uh, George Herbert Walker Bush and the beginning of the Clinton administration, the federal government here in our country got involved in bailing out the Mexican economy. And there were many people who said, what are we doing with our tax money bailing out the Mexican, Mexican economy? Fifteen years later, however, all that money has been paid back to us plus $600 million. So it was structured in a way where the American taxpayers benefited from that program and we were able to help out a neighboring country. Similarly, if we're going to get involved uh, with an auto bailout or any of these other bailouts that are being discussed, uh, we need to, I, I first of all believe there need to be congressional hearings. The members of Congress have a responsibility, a fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayers that elected them to make sure that their money is being well spent and well invested. And so I would want to make sure that any money spent or given to a financial institution or uh, a private auto automaker uh, is actually going to um, uh, do what it's intended to do. In other words, if it's going to give them a bridge loan to restructure, to make themselves more efficient, uh, to buy them time, if you will, to turn things around, that's one thing. But just to give money to a corporation that's losing money for the sake of putting off the inevitable, I don't think is a wise investment. Let's go overseas. Let's talk about terrorism. Um, where do you stand on drawing down troops in Iraq, and where should we focus? How should we address the terrorism issue? Well, unfortunately, we've seen in the past several weeks uh, what's happened over in India, and uh, without a doubt there are people who hate us and hate our friends and neighbors who love democracy. We saw what happened between Russia and Georgia. So this isn't something just in Iraq or Afghanistan or necessarily the Middle East. Uh, we have to remain vigilant in protecting ourselves, our interests, and our allies across the world. I believe with regards to Iraq and Afghanistan and the troop drawdown, uh, those decisions, I believe, ought to be made by the commanders in the field. You're not going to hear from a congressman shock uh, me pounding my fist saying, we need to pull out this number of troops by this particular date, uh, because quite frankly, I'm not an expert in the military. I'm not running for commander in chief. Uh, and I think to do so is really irresponsible uh, and puts those men and women who have volunteered their service to the country, their lives at risk. Um, I'm, um, uh, I'm encouraged by the news that the president made that beginning in January, there will begin to be a troop drawdown as a result of the troop surge a year ago, which I believe has worked in terms of quelling the violence. Uh, a year ago, I don't think anyone could have uh, predicted that the Iraqi government would actually be policing the Ambar province and many of these other regions, which were very hostile at one time earlier on, uh, which are now a much more peaceful country uh, that are being governed by that, that uh, local government. So I think it's going to take time, uh, but hopefully uh, more and more uh, of that region will be governed by the Iraqi government. And as that happens, um, the need for us to be there will lessen and we can begin drawing down the troops based on the security in that country. In the remaining 45 seconds or so, real quickly, you've been known for reaching across the aisle in Springfield. You had to reach across the aisle in Springfield. You'll have to reach across the aisle in Congress. Uh, you're not going to change your style? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I believe I'm a representative of all the people in my district, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Green Parties, you name it. And I look forward to working with all my counterparts in Washington, D.C., in the Congress, here at the state of Illinois and at local levels of government. One of the great opportunities of this new member orientation that I just went through was that it was bipartisan. 
I got to sit down at breakfast, lunch, at dinner, at these meetings with Republicans and Democrat colleagues, get to learn uh, who they are, their backgrounds, what communities they come from, what issues make them tick, and that's going to make me be a better member of Congress because I know depending on uh, the bills that I'm voting on, I can go to them uh, and work together in a bipartisan way. Aaron Schock, once again, congratulations on your election to Congress. Best of luck to you. Thanks, H. Thanks for having and me on. We look forward to having you back on to discuss further issues. Likewise. And we thank you for joining us on that issue. For the next two weeks, we'll be taking time off for the holidays because Thursdays fall on Christmas and New Year's. So we'll be back in January with another edition of At Issue. Join us then.